welcome to Arts Fest Online and to this afternoon's workshop on fashion, textiles and intellectual property with Dr. Mick Toshnik and Elizabeth Iwurie. Uh, please do switch on the cameras if you're able to. Um, we'd like this to be as interactive as possible. And of course, you can also use the chat function. Um, just a reminder that this event is being recorded and because it is a public platform, please don't share any confidential information. So welcome everyone and uh, over to you, Mecca. Thank you, Claire. It's always a pleasure to return to this room now that we've come together. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been so much fun to prepare for this one because this is not something we traditionally um, teach at undergraduate law. So um, it's, it's a bit of a different one, but it's still an exciting area of of intellectual property law. And can I just get a nod from Claire and Elizabeth if you see the slides as they're meant to be seen? Perfect. So um, for everyone who doesn't know me yet, my name is Mitka and I'm a lecturer in law. I teach intellectual property law, among other things. And I'm very keen of bringing these pockets of law also to the people who you who should be knowing them the best and that's the artists um, and we have so many of you at the school of arts and the school of performing arts so we're hoping that these sessions will be useful to your own practices if nothing else to make you more aware of what is out there now of course these workshops never are intended to replace any kind of legal advice they're meant to raise your awareness of potentially uh, things you should be thinking about when you go into practice or if you're already practicing if i remember correctly claire is in the business of making jewelry so she should be paying attention as well today <laughs> which which um just for everyone sort of uh, um information i guess is that i tend to use claire as my example and my client in these discussions um, but we have a very uh, informal approach to these uh, events so we do welcome and open questions as we move along the only slight difference today will be that there are certain areas and pockets of intellectual property law we already visited in some of the previous workshops and there we will be signposting you at the beginning more than anything else we will then have a focus on unregistered designs and registered designs and this is really where i think uh, a lot of the focus needs to be for anyone uh, into design whether it's fashion whether it's textiles or whether it is other um, objects as well and we will have the um, room to discuss questions if you have any uh, and then we will also hand over at the end we'll have some some time for uh, for uh, questions but we will also take some time to talk with elizabeth uh, around fashion in in nigeria and some of the intellectual property issues uh, in in that part of the world so we are trying to have a rich workshop and and an interactive one but we're going to start with maybe just signposting some of the other uh, intellectual property rights we, which we've already had a look at in some of the past workshops okay so when we're looking at fashion textiles and others what are we looking at protecting which are the pockets of intellectual property rights you might be thinking about or what can you protect uh, in in the fashion industry and of course it always depends on what is in front of us right it's there's no identity, there's no single way of uh, answering that question. So it all depends on what your practice is, right? We could have a discussion, and I hope we'll have a discussion at a certain point, maybe around the definition of design. We can have a discussion of what is fashion? What is fashion to you? Is it art? Is it something more utilitarian, more functional, something that will get us through the winter? You know, we could have those types of discussions and intellectual property is the area of law is the state offering protection and rewards depending on what we are creating are we creating functional items or are we creating art um, but you can also think about so when you look at a piece of clothing it can be that piece of clothing we're aiming to protect it could be the fabric itself it could be the uh, accessories that go with that it could have accessories for or hats so wears for the head you could be thinking about shoes you could be thinking about so many different aspects to this jewelry was 
part of the things I've mentioned and so forth. You also have, it's, it's not strictly fashion, sometimes we would refer to it as costumes, but you have that whole other creative sides, right? When you're thinking about theater, when you're thinking about um, movies, films, TV shows, you have a whole range of costumes, which are not traditionally something you would refer to as fashion, but that would be, that would attract with it intellectual property like, uh, rights with it as well. You are also then not just looking at the objects we're trying to protect, you're also thinking about your own positioning with that creative uh, object. So what is the brand behind it? What are the names behind it? What is the message behind that? And also when you're looking at new fabrics or maybe the way in which these objects are made, if you're thinking about either new fabrics that are responsive to a particular need, or you're thick, so a new invention, or you're thinking about 3D printing, maybe, you might even cross over from um, the more creative, inspirational pockets of intellectual property law to more technical aspects and looking at patents as well. So fashion is such a diverse, really, um, network or, or such a diverse uh, field of the creative industries that really it's worth just thinking about all the different limbs to or, or parts of this network that could potentially be of interest to your own practice. I'm going to refer, I'm not going to refer to everyone as business owners, I'm going to refer to you as practitioners, because it might be that the only interest you have in this area is to stop other people from copying you, but you're not interested in making money from it yourself. So intellectual property right gives you a monopoly over what happens with your creative works. And sometimes that's good enough for you. But also, and we had that in one of the uh, earlier workshops as well, is intellectual property rules are also important so you know where are the boundaries to your creativity. Uh, and there are no boundaries to your creativity unless you're taking other people's creativity. So you're taking their expressions, you're copying, you're imitating. So if you're doing that, there are certain rules to follow around that as well. Now, um, intellectual property rights, just by way of uh, remembering from earlier workshops, intellectual property rights are territorial rights. So you need to know the system in the UK if you're active in the UK. Since Brexit, we've seen changes. So uh, in particular in, in, uh, in fashion, it's been very helpful to have access to EU rights, which covered the entirety of the EU. And that has changed since the end of last year. So when the transition period ended, that very, very helpful, if you will, system of you being a practitioner, being a designer is no longer available in the same way. Uh, and we'll look at what's available now and what were the changes introduced. And of course, if you are um, not only practicing, but you're designing with the intent of participating in the course of trade, you will want to also be aware of how to protect your trade name, how to protect, protect the goodwill, that attractive force that brings in customers, how you will want to protect that from other designers wishing to uh, you know, take advantage of what you've created, that good name that you've created in the marketplace. So we're now just sort of reminding everyone really of what's already out there, what's already been shared. And of course, if you do have questions as we sort of move in the last portion of the question uh, and answer session, by all means, you can ask anything. You can ask on trademarks, you can ask on copyright, but we're currently now just doing this as a summary of what's out there if you are a designer, if you're in fashion, if you're thinking about practicing in the course of trade. So one thing that we had a workshop on last week, um, and recordings are available on YouTube as well, is trademarks and brands, right? So everyone will mostly be aware of the fact that you need to register your company name with company's house, and, and you sort of do the check, is the name available, you register it, and that's it, right? But we said that distinctive signs, those names that consumers get to know us by as the commercial source of the goods and services, can be very valuable and they can be easily protected under the current regime in the UK. So you would register a legal right, which is a trademark, how to do that, what are some key tips, if you will, have a look at the recording on from the 8th of June. And also we said that there are some pockets of 
protection for unregistered trademarks. And here I would mostly just emphasize that for celebrity designers, so designers who are really well known, or perhaps celebrities who've crossed over to the field of fashion, such as Rihanna, for example, in one of her, uh, so one of the bigger cases we have in this area of the law, there's some protection for celebrity name as well when thinking about attaching their endorsement to a particular product. Now, I found this as well because I've been researching all, all types of different areas for this workshop today. And uh, I think this is an interesting development which all of you should just probably be aware of. Um, that since Brexit, we've had a collective UK trademark um, made available. So there are certain uh, um, conditions attached to that. So you have to have your workers be in the UK, you have to be in the UK. Um, as much as possibly, materials need to be sourced locally as much as possible. So you have different rules attached to you using this collective trademark. So everyone who follows these rules and registers with the uh, or follows the rules of the collective UK trademark can attach this made in, in Britain um, trademark. Um, I have checked sort of what are the available goods and services you could, you could attach this to, and it seems fashion is definitely one of the sectors that would benefit, benefit from this. And I'm not uh, commenting this in the context of Brexit. I think that having heard quite a few industry talks, we're going to be we ideally most of us will be moving from fast fashion to something quite different to sustainable fashion focusing on our unique uh, distinguishable points not everyone making the same and i'm not saying that everyone was making the same design before but looking at items that will be much more sustainable that will not even be changing from season to season so potentially looking at materials and production that is sustainable could be linked to the environment itself, to the UK environment. We can have a look at this, but I thought it might just be something to put again in your field of vision or just raise awareness around this. We can chat about this further if there's any questions or interest, okay? And I promise I don't have much more. I have just copyright and patents before we open to designs and open the floor to questions as well. Okay, now the second one, I do apologize for all the noise in the background with, with the ambulances and everything. Um, the second intellectual property right, which we actually had quite a few workshops around. So you have them from 16th of March and so forth and so forth. And again, all the recordings are available. Mm -hmm. Copyright is something that, you know, especially if you have a costume or a, a item that looks really like a work of art and you, you would have had those discussions and you would have had and that might be your intent in in fashion as well that might be part of your practice where in fact it would be artistic work that you would be aiming to protect so that's one area where copyright again copyright is an intellectual property right given in works defined by the law these works need to be original, and if they are, they will give a set of exclusive rights. You cannot copy, you cannot sell, you can't put copies online, and so forth and so forth. And uh, the how long will it last, and that's really the beauty of copyright, not the beauty or, or, or the pain, really depends on what's your perspective, but copy or, copyright will last a very long time, so it exists for as long as the author of the work is alive plus 70 years afterwards. Now, what we have seen in the last two years is that even designs are deemed worthy of copyright protection if they fall within that definition of work, which is author's intellectual creation. So that is the standard. And we've seen that being um, uh, assessed by the Court of Justice of the EU, so that's a European reference, um, in a case on genes, and the case originated from Portugal. How does this play out in, so I want to give you a practical example, an example of how this plays out in, um, in the UK just in, in a little while, but I did want to mention that if you put on a, a fashion show and you're using other people's music, be aware that you need to have permission for that, or you will need to pay royalties to PRS and other collecting societies. Um, or the fashion shows 
sometimes itself can be seen as dramatic work as well. So these really are quite creative um, endeavors that we can see. So what happened now with copyright protection related to fashion and where do we see this very, very helpfully? Um, and so when you think of textiles, um, this is something that would be helpful to, to have some kind of intellectual property protection over, to have control of, if you come up with something that's original, uh, can you actually control who can use the design in the fabric? And I do remember having watched um, the one of the fashion talks that the School of Arts has put on a few weeks ago by now, um, fabric design is as creative as anything else, really. When when you look at the, I think it was was it uh, was it Union Studio? I, I can't forget. Claire, you were there as well for for the um, studio. What is it called? Is it Union Design or um, you know there were were yes. there some? Um, what, oh. Yes, it was Union, wasn't it? Oh, I'll I'll look at it and I'll pop it in the chat. Maybe maybe somebody else who's attended can can sort of say it, but I'm just yeah. trying to get everyone to think about, and that talk is also available online. It has to do with how the fashion industry works. And just looking at the inspiration boards, the mood boards, everything that they've uh, used in, in the studio, all the flowers, all the different mediums, you would say that this is definitely something to, to have protection. It falls within author's own intellectual creation uh, definition. So. The jeans case, the coffee mill case, was actually considered in one of the newer cases here in the UK, that's 2020. This was the case of response clothing. And you can see on probably in the middle of the screen for you now, Wave Fabric is the person who wanted to get protection. So what happened was that Wave Fabric came with this wave design for the fabric. You can see the back and the front of it from, from the, uh, and these are actually pictures from the court decision itself. So they are reproduced in the end of the PDF. So Wave Fabric is something that the claimant, so the party seeking to get protection, the one that was, uh, their rights were violated. Um, and they said, this is our original creation, we need to have protection. What happened was that at first, wave design was, uh, so response clothing was selling the fabric to EWM. So that's the Edinburgh, well, what is it? Something mill. Edinburgh wall, wall, isn't it, I think. Yeah, yeah, that one. So it's a big one, it's a big retailer. So they used to buy fabrics from, from our client not from our client, uh, from claimant, so from the party trying to get protection here. And then after a few years, they, stopped, they started sourcing this fabric from elsewhere. And it came through the court proceedings themselves. They've taken the samples of this fabric, given it to other people and said, mm, we want something like this. So of course, by the time response clothing sort of figured this out and they were no longer getting contracts, they were no longer being paid for their fabrics. So what's happening? Then they sort of saw the, the actual clothing in stores and said, hang on a minute, you're, you've taken our design and they've succeeded. So in this case, they have succeeded and you can see, so you have wave fabric here. So visage fabric on the very end, that's one of the ones that was then stopped. So that was one of the copyright infringements. And also here again, the, the one that was trying to get protected is the middle one, wave fabric. And then you can have on both sides, you see what were these copies that were stopped. It's not perhaps identical, but it's very, very similar, isn't it? So, um, and uh, for at least for Elizabeth, who's the copyright lawyer in the room, she will also remember, and for everyone else who has attended the copyright workshops, um, there was the case of when will you have infringement? When is copying not allowed? Is if you take too much. So you either take the whole of the work or you take a substantial part. What is a substantial part? That case was also about textiles and fabrics. So again, something that for every for anyone who's on a textile sort of path route or whatever, copyright is definitely an area of the law that you should be sort of just keeping in mind, if you will. I see I'm flailing my hand, so maybe it's time to move on to the final one before we come to the secret weapon as I've uh, uh, sort of posted it so designs so the last one is really in response usually I wouldn't even necessarily talk about patents when I speak about fashion or if if you were to speak about the more creative side of things 
but having heard both the fashion talk at the at our school of arts so there were three designers who were speaking and especially the third one ollie was speaking around all those responses and sports clothing and you know the fabric needing to solve certain issues whether it's sweating or you know whether it breathes and all sorts of things and also I've listened to a London talk, there was something, create something, um, if anyone wants, I can sort of fish out the link later on. Um, there was a talk around um, this notion of the future fashion factory. Again, thinking about that we need to be more in touch with the environment, we need to be greener, smarter, innovative building on, uh, on heritage provenance, we need to make, you know, cutting lead times, adding that, all of those, it might actually be, depending on your practice, that if you're thinking about coming up with new technical solutions to technical problems, and sometimes you'll see that even in designing jewelry, if you were to have a very particular way of, you know, making sure that the chain no longer sort of, you know, how sometimes it gets all tangled and it's impossible to take it away. I don't know. If you come up with a technical invention, then patent is the way to go. So I'm just sort of making sure that you're also just aware. And again, we can open up uh, questions if need to depending on who's in the room. So patents, necessity is the mother of all invention. And I think with COVID, there was so much discussion around, you know, how do you take pictures nowadays? Because with social distancing, the models couldn't be there. And they were discussing, they were finding and designing different software and ways of, you know, putting clothes and then the model together to have a proper shoot, you would have photographs, even though nobody was in the same room. So you might have different responses in the field, in, in industry, as, as a result of things changing and thinking also about three printing and, you know, whatever the, our responses to the environmental crisis, to climate change, sustainability demands, especially with consumers, here in the UK becoming more aware or, or trying to do better by the environment with the choices we make. The, the, all the designers were quite clear that we vote and we choose with, with our wallet. So we, we will be able to do that if designers actually give us the choice to move away from practices where the workers are not paid, where you know in a country you don't have drinking clean water, but you're using that water for genes and so forth and so forth, we are thinking about bringing the research and development phase discussion also into the business environment. So again, this is just sort of me doing the a little bit of a drawing the map of potentially something of relevance if you're thinking about technical solutions to, to, to respond to certain things. Patents, very technical, very expensive to get, but once you get it registered, you always have you almost have an absolute monopoly. Nobody can use that invention without you giving them permission, and that usually means they have to pay you for it. The length of that protection is twenty years, and patents is something that everyone would have heard of because of the current vaccine debate. That's the type of intellectual property right that we are discussing in the vaccine debate. Now. This is me stopping and asking, Claire, do we have any burning questions before we move on to? We don't, we don't have anything in the chat at the moment. Um, if anyone's got anything, if they want to switch their cameras on and um, then please feel free. Okay, so this was really just a whistle stop or so, you know, just to make everyone aware of everything we've already. So we had a workshop on trademarks, we had several workshops on copyright actually, and those also included use of photographs online, which again, as a uh, industry participant, you might be putting your designs on Instagram and other things. So if you have questions around that, we have a workshop around that as well. So there are definitely other, areas that might be of interest to everyone um, and we're happy to sign post and send the links um, either during Q, Q a or if you have a question you can email us separately as well well with that i will now sort of move to um, the secret weapon of the fashion ind industry which hopefully is secret only to the rest of the world and not to the fashion industry itself 
Um, if you were to compare protection in the US with what the EU has, the EU has been known to protect, to offer better protection to fashion designers than the US comparatively. And why is that? Is because we have in the EU system, uh, we've had a combination of different design rights that allows protecting one, if, if you have the more traditional industrial designs, you'll have protection for those. Think about car manufacturers, you know, what cars look like, aspects of that, phones, and all sorts of those technical designs, if you will, what products look like. But also we have um, these shorter types of protection that I will speak to in, in a little while that will protect, and that's why I reproduced this here, um, they will protect so many different visual aspects of what a product looks like. It is really about what people will be able to see. So if something is in, hid, hidden inside and you can't see it as a user, as a consumer, that's not a part of a design that you'll be able to protect. It might be a technical feature you're protecting under patent law, but not under design law. And that's why you see design means the appearance, right? If consumers can't see it, or the users can't see it, then that's not what we're looking at in terms of the legal protection offered. So designs, which is something that I would just like everyone to sort of uh, take away from today, is giving legal protection in what? In the appearance of the whole or part of a product resulting from the features of in particular lines, contours, colors, shape, texture, and or materials of the product itself and or its ornamentation. So you can see how that definition is broad enough to cover what we were discussing before, right? Hats, clothing, accessories, shoes, you know, earrings, jewelry, different types of objects, right? Now this definition is from EU, from the EU regime. And we'll see how the UK responded after Brexit to make sure that that level of protection is not lost because of Brexit. But the UK always had a parallel system. So if you're a designer in the, in the UK, you always had two types of rights, UK rights and EU rights. And now after Brexit, you have UK rights and UK rights, which are a response to Brexit. The old UK rights were more geared towards industrial design, think cars, but we do now have a copy of the EU design in the UK as well, which will allow for this type of protection of colors as well and a combination. And I do have some pictures at the end just to, to sort of perhaps give you an illustration fashion wise what was successfully protected as well. Now designs, uh, and we'll see again, uh, we'll see how, how that was sort of discussed by the courts, and not in any legal de detail, but with pictures. Um, what, what will be, so what is this appearance of, of products that we're protecting, right? Um, so there has to be a design and it has to be vi visible to the informed user. Design has to be new. So it can't be something that was already out there. And how is that tested? It's really looking at what's already out there. So that's the experts looking at, you know, that's, that's not new. I've seen that in 2020 done by this person or by that company. So this is a factual inquiry. You have to look at designs that are already out there and then an assessment must be made. Um, design has to be new and it has to have individual character. What is individual character depends on whether you're looking at EU or UK related rights, but it's always about what is the overall impression of the design on who, on the informed user. Who is the informed user? They're not the designer themselves, they're the consumer. So imagine if, it's, if we're looking at bags, it would be the general consumer of those bags, but they have a very keen eye and they know what's already available in the market. So, so they're not, you know, somebody who's not aware of the, all the different types of bags in, in the marketplace. Uh, in, in UK terms, the design cannot be commonplace, okay? What is not commonplace? Um, so one of the core decisions was, I'm just trying to move this. They said that, um, the commonplace, uh -huh. 
a commonplace design will be one which is trite, trivial, common or garden, hackneyed or of the type which would not, which would excite no particular attention in those in the relevant design field. So that's all of you. <laughs> so that it cannot be commonplace, it cannot be trite. Okay, so these are sort of the conditions really to focus on has to be new has to have individual character of course if you're trying to rely on it you have to have the legal rights so you are the designer or your employer will be uh, trying to establish the right but that depends on the contract and your design that you're trying to protect cannot conflict with one of the earlier rights so you can't have taken from somebody's work and then trying to claim it for yourself what is not protected? And I think that's a discussion also often happens in, in, in fashion, right? There are functional aspects. So for example, a, a Louboutins, when you are looking at the red sole of the shoe, if the red sole is on a red shoe, that's potentially functional, right? You wouldn't want to give a monopoly to only one company. The design or what made it new, what it made it different was the fact that there was that contrast. Why? Designer's choice. There was no other reason for that particular soul. Right? So if the design and the appearance of product is dictated solely by technical function, uh, one of the examples that I found very helpful made by somebody was that um, design dictated solely by technical function is the key to a lock. right? The key has to look like that so that it unlocks the lock, right? Uh, um, a plug and a socket, right? All the plugs in the UK have to have that shape, otherwise it doesn't work. So that's driven by uh, function. Also some uh, the designs that are must fit, so interconnections, those are also not protectable, again, for competition reasons, or also designs which are contrary to public policies or accepted principles of morality. So again, what you would put on you know, parts of the garment or whatever you're trying to protect. But bar from that, the, the requirements are really to look at, it has to be new, it has to have uh, this individual character, if you will. And with that, we're looking now at the two sets of rights that we have in the UK. So what happened with Brexit, right? So again, like I said, we always had two tracks. We had the EU track and we had the UK track. And the EU track was very easy to get your hands on. And there were several studies done to say that people who have sued, who have gone to courts based on their EU community unregistered design, they most, in most cases, they would have won the case. They would be able to stop whoever was making the copy and it was a positive outcome for them. So that was something that um, the industry uh, actors were very, very afraid to lose after Brexit. Because there are, yes, you have unregistered designs also in the UK and they've already, also, always existed, but they protect less. So one of the things that was excluded from those designs was the level of appearance of products. So there was no protection for colors or surface decoration. That is something you find in communities design. So what the, uh, the government did is that they have given us this new right. And what it's meant to do is to just copy over the benefits of the community design. So now in the UK after Brexit, we no longer have community design. We're no longer part of the EU framework. What we have is something that's called a supplementary unregistered design. Okay, it lasts for three years from which date from when it was disclosed, published in the public, whether you had a show, whether you were exhibited in, in, in front of trade bodies. So whatever is professionally acceptable, whatever is the practice, when you, make, when you publish it out there, where you disclose your design, from that date for three years, you have this type of protection. And also within 12 months, you can register this, this design as well. So, um, to avoid loss of rights with Brexit, because in the UK we no longer have community unregistered design, we now have something that's called a supplementary unregistered design. Um, now, of course, this will be a completely UK right, and remember that all intellectual property rights are territorial, 
So it's very important to be aware of where you're active, where you're trying to trade, are you trading in the EU? And if you are trading in the EU, you can still register a community design. Just be aware of that when you're disclosing or publishing, and this is from the government website. So again, I'll, I'll point you just to some of the resources as we're moving along from this, but there's quite a bit of government uh, guidance there as well. So this first disclosure rule, you have to remember that your design to be protected has to be new at the time of publication. So if you publish in EU first, you won't be able to, to claim UK unregistered, supplementary unregistered design because you've already shown it to the public in the EU. So strategically be aware that it's important where is your first showing. And you of course have then some guidance to say, right, you can say that you will have a unregistered design, you will have your first disclosure or publication in the UK, and you will register a design right in the EU to get protection there. For anyone, and again, that, that, not, that might not be the case here, but there's also this interim period. So for anyone who has already had a disclosure before we exited, before the end of transition period with Brexit, there is something that's called a continuing unregistered design, but these will go away within the next two years. So once all the designs that have been disclosed prior to 20, to 30, 31st of December, 2020, and then the uh, rest of the protection period. So altogether three years, once that period has expired, we will no longer have this interim protection system. So this is just for anyone who's published their design, wanted to get unregistered design protection, and they've published it before the end of transition period with Brexit, there's some interim protection there as well. Claire, do we have any questions before I move to, no? Okay, then I'm gonna be sailing through. Okay, um, the second one, which again, this is a registered design, right? Which usually we would look at things that last longer, right? Um, and I guess that was the old way of looking at things that fashion changes quite rapidly. Yes, that might've been a case and might still be the case with seasons, but we do see with Corona, we see with, uh, climate change, we see this need of more sustainability and potentially there will be brands also that will not um, really, you know, always focus on having different seasons. So because of different factors, I think it's just important, or maybe just like Claire is designing jewelry, there are certain aspects you would want to protect beyond just the one season, beyond maybe three years. So if you do have those kind of objects, you might be interested or look, look at a registered design right. It's around 50 pounds uh, according to the fee schedule of the UK government, so of the intellectual property office. So it's not that expensive, but it does take some time. So, um, and once you've registered it, you do get a number for it. So if you had an online shop, you could actually do the registered designs numbers with the items that you're trying to at least put people on notice that they can't just freely copy. So uh, registered design rights, we've always had them, but now all the registered community designs have been cloned to the UK. So previously you would have registered a, a community design and would cover all 28 member states. Once the end of transition period after Brexit happened, you would have just lost that right because the community design right no longer had a force was not binding in the UK. So the government said that all community designs are not copied over and made UK registered designs. So people didn't lose those that were registered. But you will know if you've registered a right because you have to pay fees, you know, it, it lasts up to 25 years, but you have to renew it and so forth. So there's a process around that. Um, so this burden of going through a registration process, making sure that nothing similar is, you know, similar in the sense of what is the overall impression on the informed user, nothing like that is already registered, that might be worth your while in certain cases, depending on what is the object you're trying to protect. Again, with fashion, at least back in the day when it was fast changing, there were no benefits of going through all the registration steps, waiting for it, paying for it, because unregistered protection already was sufficient 
but we see that perhaps with things changing in fashion there might be an interest uh, to look at you know just to be aware of registered design rights and perhaps take advantage of this type of protection as well how do we do that again just like we did with trademarks everything is available online the you just go how to register design uk or register design in the uk and then you have it it gives you a step by step check if, if you will and it's not so patents i've heard a number last week to get a patent registration is around six thousand pounds so you don't have these numbers uh with um designs or trademarks we said it's 200 pounds for a trademark if it's just one class with designs it's 50 and then renewal is 70 140 pounds depending on what you're doing um and if you are just like i said with registration you do have to consider some some of the um steps in the um in the process of registering your design okay what do you get so if you register a design you will get all these rights and you can ha you have the right of renewing it every five five years so maximum 25 years protection and you will know this is much shorter than a trademark which potentially can be renewed indefinitely as long as you renew it you pay the fees every 10 years so trademark is to protect the legal name or a logo so name you're using distinctive sign you're using in the course of trade or the logo or whatever it may be so that is much longer and copyright is also a much longer right compared to to this but definitely in the fashion industry being aware of the design rights is very very helpful because it gives you this uh, additional layer of protection so now finally we come to some of the examples of what was stopped in in, in the past okay so what can we stop especially the unregistered so the examples i'm going to be showing you now they're all based on unregistered design so people didn't they they just sort of started selling their collections right they didn't go through the registration process identifying which are the features of the product and all of that no they came up with a collection put it on the market and then figured out through you know market um, whether they were informed by a consumer by chance by by happenstance they would have learned that somebody else was using a similar design so we first have the karen millen case where she was able to stop so i'm just going to give you two examples here and that's an older case well not an older older in the uk sometimes you have very old cases from 1900s this one is from 2000s but still it's it's been a few years so Karen Millen was able to stop these two shirts and you can make your own mind. What do you think? You see that on, so it says Karen Millen is the one who was the designer, the original designer, and she wanted to stop the copy. That's from Savita. you see on, uh, well, I see it on my right and I'm not sure if it's a mirror image. So that was successful on behalf of Karen and also this kind of design, right? So, this was something that and you know hopefully you can either vote or you can unmute at this time I, I don't have much left i just have pictures so it's so much fun now um and i'm giving elizabeth a little bit of a warning to start getting warmed up before her talk <laughs> but karen oh karen claire what do you think is is this sort of sensible do they almost look like they're the same thing or honestly to me from here they look exactly the same um i can't actually believe they have the nerve to um to do to do that i mean they're virtually identical yeah um wow absolutely and 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 this one so this is one where if if you have the appetite for this and i i, I mean having fun is the wrong thing to say when you're going through court cases but there were hundreds of designs in this particular case so this is uh, so original beauty was the claim and so the party trying to get protection the original designer house of cb and whatever you see marked with the c is the party the designer that was the original designer and then whatever is marked with d stands for defendant so the copyist and there there was a group of um of parties on the defendant's side and not all of them were actually found to be infringing not all of them were illegal copies if you will so this one that you see now 
And again, this is a 2021 case, so it's a recent thing, and it's based on unregistered design. Unregistered design was the successful part. Other parts of intellectual property law, passing off in particular, didn't succeed. Okay, So unregistered design, again, uh, from practice, from industry experts and from lawyers in the fashion industry, they say that unregistered design is really something well worth knowing and, and thinking about as a type of protection. So the, this case was all around bodycon and bandage dresses, which you know I had to Google before I sort of started to prepare. I didn't know that that's an expression, but that's just my ignorance. I will completely accept it. So for this one that we see here, the defendant quite early on, so the, the copying designer quite early on said, yeah, yeah, mm, oops, this one is really just a copy. So <laughs> there was less of a discussion that this is a, um, um, a problem, but how the case developed was that with each of these designs, what the other side will first try to do, they will say, this shouldn't be protected. It's not new. It doesn't have individual character. It's, you know, it's what everyone does. So the court with each one of these designs, and for most of the designs, or for all of them, um, the court said, no, these designs that we see are worthy of protection they leave a different overall impression on the informed user. How did they learn? How did the court make that assessment? Is they look at the design that is asking for protection, they look at it and they compare it with what was out there before that time. And say, no, no, if you compare with what was already out there, those reference points, and this one, this one will leave a different overall impression on the informed user. And then the next step, once you say, yes, this one is worth protecting, we'll get protection. And again, under the EU type, so now we have the supplementary unregistered design, these will also give protection in things like colors and surface decoration. So it's, it's, it will have very detailed protection, if you will. It goes to very detail of the design itself. So this one was given protection. Now this one, you can again see C is for the original designer, the one suing, and D is for the copyist. Um, and again, this is for, for everyone who's sort of on the call to make their own mind, right? I mean, the, here you have a fraction of a difference in the color scheme, but that seems to be more or less the only difference. Yeah, oh, it does not. Yeah, I mean, there's the, the little sort of um, the the way it comes together, right? Um, yeah, slightly different, but I mean the actual design is exactly the same, isn't it? Yeah. It's an example of where there was no infringement. So the court said, yes, you have the same generic style dress, but there are important differences, and it's almost like you could play sort of, you know identify the differences. The court identified all the differences. So the length of the dress, you know, how the uh, the original one splits in the back, the, the second one, the copying one doesn't. So it took into consideration, and uh, I think the um, that's more or less the same, but because the generic style dress, because the dress itself was so, um, it was a type of a dress that, even these small differences were enough for there to be a different overall impression on the informed user. But I think this one, and this is really just the, the final one before I close, this one is where, I, and I've copied what the court found as an explanation as well. So again, the darker one, you see that from the original designer. And the second one is actually the one where you have this defendant copy. And at first when I saw it, I was like, ah, infringement. But you can see how the court, especially because they have experience in these areas, they will look at these differences in design and they will say, looking at these differences, this would leave a different overall impression on the informed user. And you can see what they say. The differences are the neckline, the way the loops for the lacing are made, the different fabric for the laces, the toggles for the laces, and importantly, the additional pieces of material in the original designer's uh, design that hang below the lacing. So very detailed analysis. So 
if the designers themselves are sort of worried that you know the legal infrastructure the professionals will not be able to understand all of the design craft behind it if you will that doesn't seem to be the, to be the case i think and this is where i'm closing i think the more problematic area really is that it's so expensive to get to this point where i was now showing you these pictures to sue somebody and get that protection is enormously expensive. And I've sort of given there, there's a little bit of a link there that there is some support from the UK Intellectual Property Office. They even signpost to services like mediation and some other dispute settlement uh, services. But still at the end of the day, and I remember that again, was it uh, Union Studio or Studio Des or Union Design, Claire, did you? <laughs> figure it out. So it was that, it, it, it was uh, her comments in that talk that she said that, you know, you can't be too precious about people copying your designs because unless you have the money really to go to court, if you are a, uh, a supplier to one of the bigger retail stores, you just don't want to be caught in the middle uh, of a litigation. So that is a real thing to consider um, and, and I think she also made an observation that that's why she will not put everything, her entire catalog online to keep some of the references and the inspiration to her and the catalog more exclusive to clients. But she also noticed that that is very difficult for uh, individual or for emerging designers. You have to make yourself known. So people will have to know what you're doing. And also it was challenging for the studio, which is well established by now after so many decades working um, in, in Corona times, there was no other way but to communicate online. So uh, there are distinct challenges around this sharing with your catalog with people who might want to buy it and, and, you know, moving away from that in, in, uh, or, so do we have to tread the line between sharing it with the potential consumers and yet disclosing it with people who might find your inspiration and then take the reference points and perhaps um, um, go a step further. And that really is one of the challenges, right, with fashion altogether, this derivative nature and the line between inspiration or reference versus imitation and copying. So it's, it's a thing to always keep in mind, even for your own work. So yes, one is externally facing, has somebody taken your work, but even in your own practices, you need to sort of be very much aware. I'm sure that's part of the entire course, um, you know, how you build your independence and your own creativity and you move from imitation to, to that uh, creative work. So there are several intellectual property rights that might be important and i've already mentioned this whole awareness of where fashion comes from and and how it's actually how individual items are made linked with potentially more locally sourced materials made in britain kind of initiatives and things like that um, and i think just the sort of the segue point to 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 elizabeth talks as well is that because everything is online finding references sometimes can be very very tempting as well so we might want to actually um, use uh, references from other cultures but we need to be quite careful with that what we don't want to do is cultural misappropriation and i will leave it at that now um claire do we have already any questions at this point that we should touch on no, no? We um just a, a quick comment on that company you were talking about earlier on it's design union print studio um and they're actually um their founder is one of the speakers in the fashion and textiles careers talk that i've posted a link to in the chat um, so, and it's a really, really is worth visiting because it's, it's such a great talk. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it's what, it, it was so helpful. So because it was so current in, in Corona times as well. So yes, it's a very, it, it happened just a few weeks uh, ago. So it's highly recommended to everyone if you haven't seen it yet. Um, okay. So if anyone has uh, any questions, you can pop them in the chat or we'll have some time at the end as well. Um, but Elizabeth, now the floor is yours. Okay. Okay. So, so sorry to start. Uh, my name is Elizabeth. My name is 
um, I'm a postgraduate researcher at the university. Um, I will be discussing the Nigerian fashion industry in Nigeria and intellectual property. Um, the fashion industry in Nigeria is super lucrative and very diverse. It consists of clothing, footwear, I think next slide, um, footwear, accessories, handcrafts, um, and several other departments. Um, it has really, really contributed to um, the expansion of the creative industries as well. The three main ones are um, the Nigerian music industry, Nigerian film industry, and Nigerian fashion industry. Um, the Nigerian fashion industry in particular is rooted in the 60s, um, in the post-colonial era in Nigeria, beginning in the 70s as well. Um, they experienced like a major change in the importation of foreign ready-made clothes from the UK. And because it was so big at the time, the head of state in Nigeria at the time, he he banned, he placed a ban on foreign for foreign made clothes in Nigeria. And now because of the ban, which is supposed to be a bad thing at the time, it made you know um indigenous styles um creation. Um so the dashiki, as I'm sure most of you know, um there's there's a kind of um fabric and a kind of textile called adira, which I'm sure Nigerians, any Nigerian here on the call would know, but it's known here as tie and dye, but the adira is like a tie and dye, but like with a, like a, an African kind of twist with African prints. Um, also, the, they created that Bada at the time because they didn't have ac um, access due to the Nigerian ban on foreign stuff, and they didn't have access to stuff to cover um, for men as well. So Nigerians, created indigenous styles. So many popular brands at the time, um, um, they emerged and um, they were pioneered by like the elites in a sense. Um, they created a, a concept called to match where um, the top reflects the bottom also color wise. Um, and um, they created a, um, a the association called Badan. So it's a fashion um, designers association and it's actually created by the who's actually the richest um at the time at the time she was the richest um woman in nine in africa i think also in top 10 in the world um she was the richest so it was pioneered by the elites at the time most people didn't really have access to high nigerian fashion um but this association is still active to date so by the 90s um most of the fashion stakeholders they left Nigeria due to unstable political conditions and military regime and because of the really bad economic and working environment and it affected development of the industry for a really long time. So, oh, sorry, next slide, sorry. So from the from 2000, the fashion industry began to develop styles and they embraced very modern, but also traditional, fa traditional fashion. Um, so the fabric, I think most people know, is called the Ankara fabric. Um, in the 2000s, it was big and was introduced. And at this time, um, sorry, since then, um, there's been innovation promoting Nigerian fashion outside borders. So I think this side has some um, fashion designers. Um, we have Amaka Osakwe, who is Maki O. She was actually invited to the house, to the White House by Michelle Obama. Um, she's dressed Lupita Yongo as well. Um, there's Lisa Folawiyo, who her um, family were actually one of the part of the um, pioneers in the 60s and 70s. Um, we have Banke Kuku, Diola De Segoe, Orange Culture, and Larry De Silva. So yeah, so all of these designers, they've had worldwide recognition. So I don't know if you can go to the next slide, sorry. So yes, so with the size of um, Nigerian fashion industry, global development and trends, um, there is little to no protection of fashion in Nigeria. And because of this, at the time in the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, the, the, there was agitation for legal protection of fashion rights in Nigeria. Be and um, it's all, I also want to mention that from the outside, there's no real legislation or case law addressing protection of fashion in Nigeria. But um, the Nigerian fashion industry can be protected through the umbrella of intellectual property law that exists in Nigeria, like the Nigerian Copyright Act, the Nigerian Trademark Mark Act, the Patent, Patent and Designs Act. Um, they protect fashion rights in Nigeria generally. So I think we can go to the next slide. Um, no one doubts the tremendous value of these intellectual capital, but um, the, the problems facing this industry 
include weak intellectual property laws, piracy, lack of funding, and poor government support. But I want to focus on the um, little to no attention paid to intellectual assets when it comes to the fashion industry. Um, if you can go to the next slide with the Copyright Act provision, um, copyright protection. Oh, sorry, the slide before this. Oh, sorry. Yes, sorry. Yeah, not on my not on my version, Elizabeth. Sorry. Sorry, sorry not in your version. It's on my version. Sorry. So, um, copyright protection um, is supposed to protect two dimensional aspects of clothing design, while design law is supposed to protect three dimensional designs and shape of a piece. But under Nigerian copyright and design laws, um, designers have they have significant um, challenges. So um, because we don't have the section here, I'll just read the section really quickly. Section one, subsection three of the Nigerian Copyright Act says that um, an artistic work is not eligible for copyrights if at the time when the work is made, it is intended by the author to be used as a model or pattern to be multiplied by any industrial process. Because of this pro pro provision, um, Protection under the Nigerian Copyright Act is not available where fashion designers intend to mass produce their garments. And it creates an instance where Nigerian designers who want global success are unable to profit because commercially marketed designs are not protected under Niger the Nigerian Copyright Act. So as an alternative, Nigerians can um, go to Nigerian Patent and Designs Act, but Nigerians under this act, um, when they, want, sorry, when they want mass production, they can go to the Nigerian Patents and Designs Act, but it's also very, very difficult to secure in Nigeria. Um, it's very cumbersome. Most designers who choose this route, so they're um, impeded by lengthy processing time, um, also to obtain the patent, and also the fees are very high, and also the application and registration process is just very rigorous. Um, also, there's a burden to prove that their designs are entirely new. And, um, and these designs, they have to be new and they have to vary from prior designs in every country in the world. And that's very, very hard. Um, another um, thing that's super difficult is, uh, sorry, if you contrast this with actually France, um, in France, fashion is um, protected under the Nigerian copyrights, sorry, under the French Copyright Act. So I don't have this slide and I would really like to show you guys. But yes, there's several other provisions, but particularly, these obstacles I just mentioned, and I just discussed, um, especially the one with um, having to, the burden of proof and having to be new and varying from prior designs in every country in the world is super hard. And um, it precludes protection on Nigerian IP law. And it's also like safe to say that Nigeria would benefit from reforms to the current IP framework regime, and specifically as it concerns fashion, sorry. When it comes to music and, and, um, and and film, um, the, just it's just the angle of enforcement. But when it comes to fashion, I think they we, they need like a rehaul, so an overhaul. So um, in light of COVID as well, innovation and technology has really revolutionized the fashion industry, and piracy is becoming huge again. But it also has hastened the pace of infringement and appropriation worldwide. Um, so aside from protecting these a protection from infringements. Um, there's also need for reform to protect Nigerian fashion designs and culture from appropriation. Um, so I hope this is super interesting and I hope I stuck to my time. Um, thank you so much. I have my name, my email address on my Twitter here. If you have any questions, I can answer because I have access to my slides so I can respond in the chat, um, in the chat if you have questions, but yeah, thank you. I've stopped sharing just so that, but we're we're happy to sort of reproduce anything in the chat if anyone wants yeah. to have a link or anything like that. But Elizabeth, maybe just uh, I don't see burning set of questions just yet. But hopefully, people will at least maybe describe what they do and what they were hoping to get from today's workshop. If if there are no specific questions, um, but Elizabeth, this this um, you said there's this huge group of designers who've left Nigeria because you know it was just too difficult to live in there. <laughs> Um, how, how um, when you said that they've uh, acquired this really well-known reputation, is that outside, is that abroad, or they are really well-known yes. in Nigeria? How does it work all together? So, so um, most, most of the prominent Nigerian fashion designers in Nigeria, they actually kick off 
um, globally first before they become like popular in Nigeria. So um, um, Nigerians in diaspora and just the international um, stage, they, they actually catch on to these fashion designers first before they become popular in Nigeria. That's how big the Nigerian fashion industry is. It's actually like on the world stage. And um, majority of the investments in the Nigerian fashion industry is um, private sectors and like private groups abroad coming to do fashion weeks in Nigeria that has made um, that has made like the Nigerian fashion industry really 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 big that's like a really big thing the Nigerian fashion week especially in Lagos and that's actually what draws in money so in one of my slides I put down that there's lack of funding um, from and government support but when it comes to the privates we have banks we have private entities around the world and in Nigeria actually throwing in a lot of money in the Nigerian fashion industry, even more than the Nigerian music and the Nigerian film industry. So it's really, really big. Thank you. So Claire, how, how is your jewelry design going to come along? Uh, well, I, I've put it to one side because I, um, I think that I would prefer to concentrate on my art practice. So, um, can't sort of do two, two of the things properly, I guess. Yeah, um, on top of your other job as well. And yeah. just having so much. <laughs> so, um, so I've, I've kind of put it to one side and um, yeah, just, just going to concentrate on my art practice. And that's mm -hmm. kind, of, kind of more important to me, I think. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's excellent I, I don't know probably everyone is also aware of the made in wolves platform right the that's probably something that's discussed at the school of arts anyway um yeah so i mean that's us done um and, and if there are no questions we're, we're quite happy to close but maybe if you don't want to put on your cameras or speak maybe at least in the chat you could tell you could tell us a little bit around your practice who you are, it would be really good just to know who's in the room. Let's see if that's gonna come through. Um, but yeah, I, I found it now because uh, under EU, you couldn't have the origin rules, right? You couldn't say by Irish, you couldn't say, you know, by British, that would have been discrimination, which wasn't allowed back under the old rules. So I found that made in Britain trademark as a new development, something that, you know, not because it's made in Britain, but if you were to use that because it's made by British workers, because the goods and the, the materials are sourced locally, I think it was something that could have been of quite um, great importance to, to, to smaller designers. I've heard a lot around, so in both different talks, not the historical one, but both the one you've sent a link to and the other industry one, I think that developing a conscience as well in how these products are created and they're meant to last longer and everything. I think a lot of things are sort of driving progress to go on down a very particular route, um, you know, having fewer pieces, but they last longer. And, and then, you know, if you're putting more money towards those pieces, you can also start selecting your choice, just like you would with, you know, um, the type of food you buy or, you know, how, if you need it, uh, certain farmers, or it goes the same with animal type products, right? How, how are they treated? What are the standards there? So I think that's been much more part of the passion discussion as well. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I think, I think it, we're starting to move away from, um, you know, this, well, I hope we are. I, I feel like perhaps we are this um, throwaway fashion that maybe doesn't, is not ethically, it doesn't have a very good ethic, you know, the, the, the way, way it's made in factories and, and all of that. You know, I don't know, Primark, for instance, I'm perhaps giving, um, you know, that, that kind of uh, thing where everything's really cheap and, um, you know, you perhaps only wear it once or twice and then you only throw it away rather than buying more expensive key pieces that will last you for a really long time. Perhaps they're more ethically sourced materials I guess and exactly to that point I found it so interesting in that industry talk that you have now these disruptors in the market looking at renting fashion right so they, yes. they have an entire platform of you know yeah. items that can be rented out 
exactly for the special type occasion and mm -hmm. then they can be more more bold in colors more you know um and and actually they said that working with then uh, individual designers will be much more needed and it was something welcome and an opportunity really for those designers because it's that special piece that you're wearing i don't know for a wedding or a show or theater opening or whatever it is and your traditional wardrobe if you will is something that you have you know sort of a a reliable stack there that you know whether it's for the office or for whatever it might be so um yeah so so that's sort of um um, we do have oh, a question from Elizabeth. Um, does anyone have examples of recent events affecting the fashion industry in the country? Yeah, because I'm saying like in light of COVID, it's yeah. been like a lot of like stories yeah. of people just um, trademarking. You know how people um, take website domains for like names in advance. I've been seeing like a lot of that in recent times where people are getting trademarks for like cultures, tribes, names. Um, recently, um, everyone knows like the three major tribes in Nigeria is Yoruba, Hausa and Igbo recently a company that's actually defunct that actually doesn't really operate went and trademarked um, the term Yoruba and some Yoruba attires as well and um, the name of the company is actually called I think in book two official or global or something and that's actually a company a country the name of a country in Africa as well and um so we went on to check and wasn't even a company that had any um, affiliation to Africa as, uh, at all. And it just reminded me of, you know, the time where Kim Kardashian also tried to um, get a company and call it Kim Ono, where she was um, selling mm -hmm. something that has nothing to do with the actual Japanese attire. So yeah. uh, I'm seeing like a lot of that like happening um, in recent times. I wanted to find out if, you know, um, other um people in the chats from like other countries have like instances like that because I don't know every single attire from every single you know, tribe or com country in the world so yeah I think more yeah I don't think anyone has like any examples yeah or more questions yeah should we then close it and just sort of yeah. again i will share my email as well elizabeth if you want to share your email as well um like we said we had a few workshops already with copyright and with trademarks so those parts if you haven't attended might feel rushed today but that's because we have other workshops and and you're welcome to view them and if afterwards you have questions by all means get in touch um, but it's the design rights that I think are not as heavily discussed in different forums. And yet industry professionals who know the field, they will always say you need to be aware of design rights because they're absolutely the best way to get some kind of protection. And if you have a registered design, you put that number there, but you don't have to just so you're aware. So unregistered design protection is available once you put the design out there. Well, I've got um, links to our previous sessions, copyright and the moral rights in artistic works and uh, the photography and online uh, session that we did. The one from last week on trademarks and branding that will be up later on today. Um, so just check our YouTube channel for that. And, and of course, this one uh, will go up in the coming days too. So. Yeah. And next week we have a bit of a different one. So I'm not sure if it's the same audience, but we're looking at music. So if anyone is interested in the music one, there's a separate session next week, um, which hopefully, Elizabeth, are you joining the music one? Next week, Tuesday and 22nd, right? Yeah, 22nd. The yeah. same time, it's the same time, yeah. Good. If there are no questions. Well, um, thanks, Nicole and Elizabeth. I mean, you know, it's, it's just so useful, isn't it? I, I, these sessions are really good to watch back, I think, because as your career progresses, as your business progresses, you know, inevitably you always, you're gonna have these questions that crop up. Um, so I think it's just really great for us to have a place where you can view these sessions back again. Um, so I hope you all find that interesting and useful at home. Um, as we've just said, our next intellectual property event is next Tuesday, 22nd June, and that's at 2pm, and that's about music. Um, 
But before that, we also have a conversation with artist Robert Lutzar, and that's on Monday, the 21st of June at 7 pm. So we'll be in conversation with him. So that'll be a really interesting session too. Um, you can book for free through Eventbrite and so pop over to there and see if there's anything that takes your fancy. And um, we hope to see you there. Thanks for watching. Um, and thanks both again. Just brilliant to have you. So, yeah, thank you so much, Claire, for putting this together. Super. Well, it's an absolute pleasure. See you next week. Yes, absolutely. All right. <laughs> Bye, Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.